So uh, thank you, Dr. Black, and good morning, everybody. Um, John Osirman, one of the PGY2 residents, uh, UBC Urology Program. Uh, I'll be speaking today about uh, what you as a urologist might need to know about Lynch syndrome and how urology patients are affected by the disease. So I'll start with a patient of Dr. Black's who was originally referred for bladder cancer and a two centimeter left ureteric lesion. Uh, this was a few years ago. The patient is now 69 years of age, but was 57 at the time of referral. Her medical history included endometrial cancer treated with a hysterectomy in 1996, along with breast cancer treated with a segmental mastectomy in 2009. Family history was largely unremarkable. <clears throat> she previously underwent a TURBT in December of 2009, showing T1 high-grade disease. Re-TUR with Dr. Black showed benign bladder urethelium. <clears throat> Upper tract cytology showed high-grade cells. Retrograde pilogram showed a two-centimeter filling defect, and there was hydronephrosis present in the left kidney on CT. Uh, she was treated with a radical nephroureterectomy in April of 2010 with pathology showing T2 high-grade disease. Surveillance IVPs and uh, cystoscopies since then have been clear. Unfortunately, uh, she was since diagnosed with sigmoid cancer in 2017 and was subsequently referred to the, to the uh, hereditary cancer program. She underwent a sigmoid colectomy in February of 2018. <clears throat> we'll come back to this case a little bit later on in the presentation. So the idea of uh, hereditary cancer was originally reported by Adrian Worthen in 1913, who has been dubbed the father of cancer genetics. Worthen was an internist and a pathologist. The story goes that he got wind of a friend's family history, including multiple cancer-related deaths, and he put together an extensive genealogy for Family G. He published the data in the archives of internal medicine and suggested that there was some irritability to the disease. Years later, Family G was found to have Lynch syndrome. <clears throat> Though not widely accepted in the medical, medical community at the time, Henry Lynch compiled further data suggesting a cancer family syndrome that was uh, hereditary in nature. He defined criteria which are now widely accepted for genetic cancers. <clears throat> Number one, early age of onset of the disease. Number two, a specific pattern of multiple primary cancers. And number three, Mendelian patterns of inheritance. Cancer family syndrome was changed to Lynch syndrome in 1984 by Boland and Truncal, and is now also referred to as hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. We now know that Lynch syndrome is an inherited condition of a defective DNA mismatch repair system. This repair system proofreads and edits our genome post-replication and ensures its integrity. The cancer syndrome is caused by germline mutations in DNA mismatch repair genes, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, PMS2, MLH3, and PMS1. More recently, the EPCAM mutation has also been added to the spectrum. <clears throat> the two most predisposing genes include MLH1 and MSH2, which account for 30 to 40% of all reported mutations. Defects in DNA uh, mismatch repair genes cause a predisposition to multiple cancers, classically including colorectal, endometrial, stomach, small bowel, hepatobiliary, upper tract urethelial, and ovarian cancers. Continued investigation, the Lynch syndrome tumor spectrum continues to grow, and over the last few years, glioblastomas, pancreatic, breast, prostate, and rare adrenal cortical tumors have been shown to be more prevalent in patients with Lynch syndrome. Looking at the overall Lynch syndrome epidemiology, it appears that Lynch syndrome occurs somewhere between 1 in 250 to 1,000 people in the general population and accounts for 1% to 4% of all colorectal cancer cases. Specific mutations affect the risk of specific cancers in Lynch syndrome. MLH1 or MSH2 mutations account for 60 to 80% of Lynch syndrome-associated cancers. MSH6, PMS2, and rarely the EPCAM molecule, which is uh, epithelial cell adhesion molecule mutations, 
make up the majority of the remaining cases. MSH2 can be epigenetically inactivated by a germline deletion in the EPCAM molecule. EPCAM deletions lead to transcriptional read-through, which silences MSH protein expression. MSH2 mutations are associated with the highest risk of extracolonic cancers, most commonly endometrial, followed by urothelial carcinoma. According to the NCCN, MSH2 and MLH1 gene variant carriers have a cumulative cancer risk up to age 70 of 30 to 82% in colorectal cancer, 14 to 60% in endometrial cancer, risk of gastric cancer is 24% in Japan, and 6 to 13% in Western countries. The cumulative risk of upper tract urothelial carcinoma is 1 to 7%. Regarding mechanisms of DNA damage and acquisition of genetic mutations leading to cancer, there are many different pathways that can lead to a mutation. There's been significant attention in the metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer world paid to the homologous recombination repair pathway with ongoing research in PARP inhibition. HRR leads to high fidelity repair and avoiding loss of information with the use of a second chromosome as a template. Such effectors include BRCA1, BRCA2, along with others to carry out DNA repair. I mainly bring this up to point out that this is a different mechanism than what we're discussing today, and that Lynch syndrome patients fit under the mismatch repair pathway rather than the HRR, uh, HRR pathway. With that said, Lynch syndrome is diagnosed by identifying germline mutations in the mismatch repair gene. Using Knudsen's two-hit hypothesis, if one of the mismatch repair genes is mutated in the germline, there's a high probability that a second hit of somatic mutation will occur in the other copy of that gene. This can disable mismatch repair function and can lead to accumulation of downstream mutations and eventually cancer. As can be seen in the second image, if incorrect nucleic acid base pairs are incorporated during DNA replication, Mismatch repair proteins will cleave the erroneous base pair to correct the error. If this mechanism fails, the error is incorporated into the DNA strand. Alterations in the length of microsatellite repeat regions can cause single base point mutations, insertions, or deletions, and these are a direct result of defective mismatch repair activity. Microsatellite instability is found in more than 90% of Lynch syndrome-associated colorectal cancers, compared to only 15% in sporadic colorectal cancer. Microsatellite instability is a hallmark of tumors in Lynch syndrome, and high frequencies of microsatellite instability have been reported, especially in urothelial carcinomas. Here you can see a simplified diagram of the mechanism of action of the mismatch repair complex, in normal cells, the DNA mismatch repair mach machinery ensures genomic fidelity. This is done by recognition of the mismatch repair uh, of the mismatch by the MSH2 and MSH6 complex, and reparation by the MLH1 and PMS2 and 1 complex. In MSI tumor cells, the deficient MMR system results in the inability to repair DNA mismatches in the microsatellites. This leads to accumulation of mutations and different genomic codons. <clears throat> in order to identify microsatellite instability, PCR is used to amplify DNA markers in both tumor tissue and healthy tissue. The two tissue samples are compared to assess whether abnormal microsatellite repeats are observed in the uh, tumor DNA. In the top image, you can see the comparison between tumor microsatellite and normal uh, microsatellite lengths. The variations in the tumor tissue are evident in their non-uniform appearance and increased number of DNA slippage events. Ultimately, the microsatellite instability does not directly cause cancer, but microsatellites are easy to detect given their repetitive pattern and ultimately tell us that there is mismatch repair deficiency present, which may lead to DNA mutations. Immunohistochemistry staining can be used to complement microsatellite um, testing. IHC looks for the presence of uh, certain proteins in tissue. Immunohistochemistry and Lynch syndrome tests the expression of MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2 proteins in tumor tissues. <clears throat> 
The bottom image there is from a 6.8 centimeter chromophobe renal cell carcinoma in a 59 year old female with known Lynch syndrome and endometrial carcinoma. IHC staining for mismatch repair proteins expression shows nuclear expression of MLH1 and PMS2 and complete loss of nuclear expression of MSH2 and MSH6. Although a good screening mechanism, microsatellite instability isn't specific for Lynch syndrome associated cancers, as like I said, approximately 15% of sporadic colorectal cancers demonstrate microsatellite instability. Sporadic cancers with microsatellite instability are commonly characterized by epigenetic silencing of mismatch repair protein translation through promoter hypermethylation. This is caused most commonly by MLH1 methylation and BRAF gene mutations. Therefore, BRAF mutation and MLH1 methylation tests are used to distinguish sporadic from Lynch syndrome associated colorectal cancers. Ultimately, the gold standard in diagnosing Lynch syndrome is germline testing, where you look at non-tumor cell DNA from either blood or saliva and analyze for the gene responsible for the deficient mismatch repair protein. The image there displays a direct sequence analysis from MSH2 where a nonsense mutation was identified. <clears throat> The Amsterdam criteria were originally uh, established to determine whether a family would warrant further workup for Lynch syndrome and identify candidates for genetic testing. The original Amsterdam criteria was colloquially known as the 321 criteria, including three or more family members with diagnosed uh, colorectal cancer, two affected generations, and one diagnosis before the age of 50. They excluded patients with familial adenomatous polyposis. The Amsterdam II criteria were extended in 1999 to include extracolonic cancers with otherwise similar criteria. The Amsterdam II criteria had a sensitivity of only 22%, but a specificity of 98%. So the Bethesda guidelines were developed to improve on the sensitivity. These included colorectal patients or colorectal cancer patients diagnosed at less than 50, presence of colorectal cancer or another Lynch syndrome associated tumor, colorectal cancer with high microsatellite instability in patients less than 60, patients with a first degree relative diagnosed at less than 50, those with colorectal cancer or a Lynch syndrome associated cancer at any age. In, the first, uh, in two first or second degree relatives. The Bethesda criteria did improve on the Amsterdam criteria sensitivity going from 22 to 82%, though these criteria have still been shown to miss as many as 27% of individuals with Lynch syndrome. In 2008, Watson studied the risk of extra colonic, extra endometrial cancers in Lynch syndrome. They showed urologic cancers were the next most prevalent cancer after colorectal, colorectal and endometrial and had a lifetime risk of 8.4% up to the age of 70. The risk of upper tract urothelial carcinoma was found to be 6% when bladder cancers were excluded. The highest risk was for carriers of the MSH2 mutation and uh, this was 28% for males and 12% for females. Rates were seven times higher in MSH2 than MSH1 family members. The period of highest risk for urothelial carcinoma was between the ages of 50 and 70. <clears throat> Watson recommended that urothelial carcinoma uh, occurs frequently enough to justify further exploration, whereas cancer types um, or other cancer types occurred too infrequently to justify cancer control interventions. In 2013, uh, the group out of Toronto published data on bladder cancer and Lynch syndrome. The goal of this study was to further investigate the risk of bladder cancer and Lynch syndrome patients. Microsatellite instability analysis and immunohistochemistry of the mismatch repair proteins was performed, and the results compared to sporadic bladder tumors. 6.2% of patients with MSH2 mutations were found to have bladder cancer. This was significantly different compared to the general Canadian population. 
Of these 11 tumors, 82% lacked expression of MSH2 on immun immunohistochemistry, and no matched sporadic cases displayed abnormal expression of MSH2 or MLH1. 2.3% of Lynch syndrome patients with bladder cancer had MLH1 mutations, which was not significantly different compared to matched cases. The incidence of upper tract disease among MSH2 carriers was almost 4% in this cohort, and every uh, single tumor was found to be deficient in MSH2 expression on immunohistochemistry. The group determined that Lynch syndrome patients with MSH2 mutations are likely at an increased risk for not only, only upper tract disease, but also bladder cancer. And these patients could be offered appropriate screening. Building on this, Crockett and his team compared sporadic upper tract tumors to those with Lynch syndrome associated disease. He looked at specific risk factors and found that upper tract disease is diagnosed more often in younger patients and exhibits a higher proportion of ureteral tumors. Patients are also at higher risk of developing bilateral tumors. Linati published a review article in meta-analysis in December of 2021 in the European Urology Oncology, uh, overviewing upper tract disease in Lynch syndrome patients. They found that multifocality was rare at diagnosis and metastatic disease was also rare. Two studies directly compared features of Lynch syndrome patients to those with sporadic disease they identified that smoking history was non-contributory to developing upper tract disease and Lynch syndrome. No significant difference was found between Lynch syndrome related and sporadic disease according to tumor size, tumor grade, and tumor stage. So far, we've mainly talked about patients with a known diagnosis of Lynch syndrome. But what about diagnosing Lynch syndrome in patients who present with upper tract disease as their primary cancer? A large multi-institutional retrospective database analysis completed by Audinet showed as many as 21.3% of patients with newly diagnosed upper tract disease were at risk for Lynch syndrome. Consensus opinion in the EAU favor favors further investigation only in patients deemed to be at high risk for hereditary-like disease. Clinical characteristics included, number one, age of diagnosis less than 60, number two, female gender, and number three, family or personal history of other Lynch syndrome-related cancers. These were the accepted risks, uh, risk factors prior to their review in 2021. <clears throat> At the moment, uh, most active screening guidelines exist for colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer, with positive results prompting genetic consultation and further DNA testing. With regard to urologic guidelines, the EAU recommends that patients with upper tract disease undergo germline DNA sequencing only if they screen positive. The checklist shown was developed to assist urologists in identifying patients with upper tract urothelial carcinoma deserving of molecular testing for Lynch syndrome. The checklist is a little bit tough to see on the slide, but the red portion on the left shows age at diagnosis less than 65, the orange box is a personal history and the yellow boxes include family history of malignancies including colorectal, endometrial, upper tract, gastric, ovarian, pancreatic, hepatobiliary, small bowel, sebaceous, uh, sorry, sebaceous gland, uh, keratoacanthomas, or brain cancers. If the red box is ticked, if there's one box uh, ticked in the uh, orange section, or if there's one tick in the family history with age less than 50, or two ticks in the family history regardless of age, microsatellite instability testing is indicated. Going through the exercise for Miss LS, who I introduced at the start of the talk, she gets a tick for her endometrial cancer, one tick for her age of diagnosis at 43 years, one tick for her upper tract disease, and another for her colorectal cancer. By this updated survey, we would, uh, she would have warranted further screening after each one of her cancers other than her breast malignancy and wouldn't have had to wait until she was finally diagnosed with colorectal cancer to have Lynch syndrome screening. Of note, when she finally underwent genetic testing 
for her uh, colorectal tumor. Results showed loss of MSH2 protein, and she was diagnosed with uh, Lynch syndrome thereafter. With regard to microsatellite instability and immunohistochemistry testing, Palomaki pooled data from 17 studies looking at the sensitivity and specificity in colorectal cancer. They found a sensitivity and specificity of 85% and 90% for MSI and 83% and 89% for immunohistochemistry. Unfortunately, there's minimal data focusing on uh, these numbers for upper tract disease. Hartman analyzed 73 upper tract urothelial carcinoma specimens and reported a sensitivity of 63% for both MSI and IHC and a specificity of 85% and 88 respectively. With these numbers, we must recognize that patients with a negative upper tract urothelial carcinoma screen on immunohistochemistry, but a high clinical suspicion for Lynch syndrome may actually still prompt referral to a geneticist and for germline testing for Lynch syndrome. With those numbers in mind, Metcalf implemented stage screening for all new upper, th upper tract urothelial carcinoma diagnoses without a prior history of Lynch syndrome, using known cases of Lynch syndrome as controls. 115 patients with upper tract disease without a history of Lynch syndrome were universally screened during follow-up. They evaluated risk using Amsterdam criteria, tumor immunohistochemistry, and microsatellite instability. And patients who screened positive were referred for clini uh, clinical genetic analysis and counseling. Of the 115 patients, 14% screened positive for potential Lynch syndrome, 7% met the Amsterdam criteria, 11% had loss of at least one mismatch repair protein, and 6% had high microsatellite instability. All 16 patients were referred for germline testing and only nine actually completed genetic analysis and counseling. Six ended up with a confirmed diagnosis of Lynch syndrome. Jew's team in 2018 noted that upper tract disease presents at a similar age to colon cancer and Lynch syndrome, and thus upper tract disease may be the sentinel event in some patients. They note that Lynch syndrome accounts for about 2-6% to of both colorectal and endometrial cancers, and as such, Lynch syndrome likely accounts for similar uh, percentages of upper tract disease, and they suggest reflexive immunohistochemistry and microsatellite instability testing be included in diagnostic guidelines for all upper tract disease. So screening review so far has been for patients with no prior Lynch syndrome diagnosis. Linati's review article in 2021 found six studies reporting on upper tract urothelial carcinoma screening recommendations for known Lynch syndrome patients. Five publications suggested offering screening for upper tract disease among all Lynch syndrome patients, while two recommended to screen only MSH2 mutation carriers or patients with a family history of urothelial carcinoma. Different protocols were implemented. Urinalysis and or urine cytology was recommended in four studies. Interestingly, Mirage's group found a very low sensitivity of only 29% for urine cytology among a 977 patient cohort and did not recommend cytology be used in screening Lynch syndrome patients. So with mixed information out there regarding who, how, and when to screen patients, we look to the uh, guidelines for further direction. Screening for urinary tract cancer is not recommended by the European Lynch syndrome guidelines. The U.S. Multi-Society Task Force on Colorectal Cancer call for surveillance using urine microscopy to identify microscopic hematuria in patients aged 30 to 35 with any mismatch repair mutation. In, a 20, uh, in 2015, a panel of um, experts recommended surveillance with yearly uh, urinalysis. They also recommended CT urography and cystoscopy for follow-up of previously diagnosed colorectal cancer. Recommendations published in JAMA included yearly or twice yearly urinalysis with cytology beginning at age 25 to 35, 
The EAU review states that considering the high risk of urothelial uh, upper tract disease and early age of onset, screening is recommended for all Lynch syndrome patients starting at age 45 to 50, including urinalysis, urine cytology, along with abdominal ultrasound every two years. They also recommend that among MSH2 mutation carriers or patients with a family history of urothelial carcinoma, you might consider increasing that frequency to, to yearly, alternating between ultrasound and abdominal CT. Ultimately, the evidence is unclear how to screen these patients. At present, we know that surveillance for patients with Lynch syndrome has only been demonstrated effective for colorectal cancer. One study with a three-year endoscopic surveillance was shown to re reduce mortality by 65%. From a gynae perspective, annual bimanual pelvic exams and endometrial biopsies are indicated for endometrial cancer screening. Women who have concluded childbearing or hit the uh, age of 40 may undergo prophylactic hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. Despite unclear screening guidelines from a urologic perspective, it's clear that these Lynch syndrome patients should be followed by a multidisciplinary management team. Ultimately, the surgical management options remain unchanged for Lynch syndrome associated upper tract disease. Options include nephron sparing surgery and radical nephroureterectomy with bladder cuff removal by open laparoscopic or robotic approach. The type of treatment should be decided based on tumor risk stratification, which we will get to more in a moment. Low risk upper tract disease can be treated with nephron sparing surgery with oncologic results similar to those of radical nephro U and lower risk of adverse outcomes such as chronic kidney disease. Since Lynch syndrome associated upper tract disease occurs in patients at a younger age and with a higher risk of bilateral disease, conservative management using ureteroscopic laser ablation and therefore renal preservation has been suggested. Of course, this management strategy must be balanced in the presence of high risk disease and frequent endoscopic surveillance is required after nephron sparing surgery. The EAU breaks upper tract disease down into low and high risk categories. Low risk disease includes unifocal, uh, unifocal disease with a tumor size less than two centimeters, low grade cytology, low grade biopsy results, and no evidence of invasion on CT. High risk disease involves radiographic hydronephrosis, tumors greater than two centimeters in size, high grade cytology, high grade biopsy results, multifocal disease, previous cystectomy for bladder cancer, and variant histologies. Knowing the disease risk category is important, uh, dictates which uh, treatment modalities are re uh, recommended. This schematic is from the EAU's guidelines on upper tract urothelial carcinoma in 2017. Note that high risk disease generally shifts management towards radical nephro U rather than nephron sparing surgery. Going back again to Lenati's review from 2021, six publications reported on surgical approach. Radical nephro U, segmental ureterectomy, and ureteroscopic laser ablation were performed in various Lynch syndrome patients. Only two studies described long-term oncologic outcomes. Arneo and their team analyzed 11 patients treated with radical nephro U and one with segmental ureterectomy. With a medium follow-up of uh, five and a half years, they recorded two recurrences requiring chemo and one upper tract disease-related death. Five-year cancer-specific and overall survival were 91% and 81% respectively. Huboski looked at nephron-sparing surgery uh, using ureteroscopic laser ablation in a 13-patient cohort. Patients underwent laser ablation and resection, followed by surveillance cystoscopy, retrograde pilogram, and ureteroscopy with laser ablation every three months until the patient was disease-free. After that, ureteroscopy was performed every six months for five years and annually after that. <clears throat> 
Overall, with a mean follow-up of approximately five years, there were three ipsilateral upper tract recurrences, seven cases of bladder cancer recurrence, and one case of distant metastasis. Ipsilateral upper tract uh, recurrences occurred in a mean time of 64 months, and this was treated endoscopically as well. Two patients died of METs from other Lynch syndrome-associated malignancies. The authors suggested that laser ablation might be feasible to avoid the comorbidities related to radical nephro-U. As it stands currently, there is only weak evidence indicating surgical treatments other than radical nephro-U among Lynch syndrome patients. Further studies are certainly warranted in the area. Regarding long-term oncologic outcomes between hereditary and sporadic disease, Audinet showed no significant difference in recurrence-free survival, cancer-specific, and overall survival with a mean follow-up of three years for all comers. Holland analyzed 112 patients treated with radical nephro-U and adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy for high-risk or locally advanced disease. With a median follow-up of 19 months, <clears throat> they showed a significant benefit in cancer-specific and overall survival for their hereditary-like cases, suggesting Lynch syndrome-associated upper tract disease may be more sensitive to chemotherapy. You can see the results on the Kaplan-Meier curves with the overall survival on the top left, cancer-specific survival on the top right, and progression-free survival on the bottom. Different regimens of follow-up are indicated depending on the tumor pathology. There's no distinction made in the CUA guidelines between Lynch syndrome and sporadic upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Follow-up includes some combination of history and physical, urine cytology, cystoscopy, chest x-ray, CT urography, and ureteroscopy. These are done at different intervals depending on pathologic staging. Due to the younger age of presentation in Lynch syndrome patients, minimizing radiation exposure is supported. Although CT urography is the imaging modality recommended by the guidelines, MR imaging is an alternative if CT urography is contraindicated. Bladder tumors are not classically included in the Lynch syndrome tumor spectrum, and the risk of uh, bladder cancer has been less investigated relative to upper tract disease. I previously showed data from the Toronto group suggesting increased bladder cancer incidence in Lynch syndrome. Others have suggested similar results, especially in those with MSH2 mutations. Huang did a uh, systematic review attempting to update the uh, spectrum of urologic malignancies in Lynch syndrome. This review showed that patients with Lynch syndrome have a higher rate of bladder cancer and it occurs at a younger age. Jost showed that the cumulative risk of bladder cancer with respect to specific mismatch repair genes, um, the MSH2 gene mutation showed the highest rate um, of disease. With regard to prostate cancer, the cumulative lifetime risk among mismatch repair mutation carriers may be as high as 30% in comparison to 18% in the general population. Ryan completed a meta-analysis of 23 studies of Lynch syndrome-associated prostate cancer, and this showed that the risk of prostate cancer in men with Lynch syndrome is higher for those who have a history of colorectal cancer, carry one of the mismatch repair mutations, or are from a mutation-carrying family. Further, this meta-analysis indicated that 74% of uh, prostate cancers in mutation carriers were mismatch repair protein deficient, especially MSH2 mutations. Importantly, Lynch syndrome associated prostate cancer does not seem to occur at an earlier patient age or be more advanced at diagnosis. Prostate cancer is uncommon before the age of 50, whereas other Lynch syndrome associated cancers are more likely to have been diagnosed by that time. Patients with Lynch syndrome more commonly die of colorectal cancer, preventing prostate cancer from even having the chance to develop. Certainly this could mask the actual incidence of Lynch syndrome associated prostate cancer and explain its lower prevalence. <clears throat>
Despite this, prostate cancer screening has been investigated in sporadic versus germline mismatch repair variants. The impact study reports on the usefulness of PSA screening in this population. Bancroft investigated men 40 to 69 years of age with known germline mutations of MLH1, MSH2, and MSH6. They compared them to age-matched men with no variants. Men who had a PSA level higher than three were offered a truss biopsy and histopathological analysis was completed. So far, the study has only reported on the first screening round, and therefore these are preliminary results. The incidence among MSH2 carriers was 4.3% compared to 0.5% for non-carrier controls. Incidence for MSH6 carriers was 3%, and no cases were detected among the MLH1 carriers. When looking at the incidence of clinically significant prostate cancer, the incidence among MSH2 carriers was 3.6% compared to 0% among MSH2 non-carrier controls. Moving on to systemic therapies, Immune checkpoint in inhibitors continue to show promise as systemic therapy in metastatic disease. Immune checkpoints regulate the immune system as not to attack its own cells in an indiscriminate manner. Program DEATH1 and CTLA4 provide negative immune feedback, which can suppress the body's T cell responses. In 2015, LOSA showed that cancers with microsatellite instability can overexpress immune checkpoint proteins, downregulating the immune response against pathologic tumor cells. Lynch syndrome cancers have high rates of mutation with overexpression of immune checkpoint proteins, PD-1 and CTLA-4. Though immune activity is most likely compounded by tumor antigenicity from mismatch repair deficiency rather than its direct link to PD-L1. Cancers without microsatellite instability are less immunogenic and therefore do not respond as well to immunotherapy. Pembrolizumab, which binds to and blocks PD-1, has previously been approved for mismatch repair deficient tumors. Pembrolizumab has shown promise in its efficacy treating colorectal and extracolorectal mismatch repair deficient cancer including upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Keynote 158 is a non-randomized phase two study assessing the efficacy and safety of pembrolizumab. Patients were included with advanced unresectable and or metastatic non-colorectal cancer with microsatellite instability or mismatch repair deficiency. Patients received pembro once every three weeks for two years or until disease progression, toxicity, or patient withdrawal. The figure shows the duration of response once the patient is started on pembrolizumab. Ongoing response represents those whose disease have not yet progressed, those who have not initiated other cancer treatments, and those who had not died at the time of analysis. The study is uh, it's difficult to directly apply to urologic malignancies, as a small number of urologic malignancy cases were included in the study, but certainly this seems to be an area of great potential and further studies are warranted. Dr. Black also brought to my attention that the GUNS trial being run here at UBC by Dr. Gleave is relevant to this discussion. GUNS stands for the Genomic Umbrella Neoadjuvant Study, where investigators are testing targeted therapies in patients with high-risk localized prostate cancer by matching neoadjuvant uh, therapies to baseline genomic alterations found in prostate biopsy tissue. Participants are treated with an induction period of at least eight weeks of ADT plus apalutamide while genome sequencing is completed. Patients are then assigned to a specific sub-protocol according to the res results of the genomic profile. Radical prostatectomy follows after the protocol treatment has been completed. Notably, sub-protocol 4 includes those whose sequencing shows hypermethylation, microsatellite instability, Lynch syndrome, or CDK12. 
otherwise classified as immunogenic cancers. They then receive an anti pdl one drug called atezolizumab. As far as I'm aware, they're still recruiting for this study, but the results will certainly be interesting to see once available. There's also developing evidence that suggests DNA mismatch repair proteins may increase tumor response to radiotherapy. Microsatellite instability cancers exhibit radiation sensitivity due to the role mismatch repair proteins play in DNA damage repair. Misra mismatch repair deficiency acts at multiple stages in the pathway, affecting cell arrest, repair, and apoptosis. A simplified schematic is seen in the figure. This shows DNA damage response pathways following uh, ionizing radiation exposure. As you can see by the red and pink boxes scattered throughout the diagram, there are multiple steps where deficient MLH1 and MSH2 may affect response. On the other hand, studies have shown an increased rate of primary pelvic cancers after radiotherapy for other malignancies. Rombot's study analyzed the association between pelvic radiation therapy and the development of rectal cancer as a second primary cancer. 192,000 patients were included, with 62,000 patients previously treated with radiotherapy for pelvic cancer. 50% of radiated tumors were prostate cancer and 19% were for bladder cancer, though other pelvic cancers were also included. Results showed that 1,300 patients developed a primary rectal cancer after radiation. On sub-analysis, prostate patients had an increased risk of rectal cancer with a subhazard ratio of 1.89. Interestingly, a protective effect of radiotherapy was observed in patients with bladder cancer with a subhazard ratio of 0.67. Though this study did not isolate Lynch syndrome patient risk with previous radiotherapy, logic might suggest that uh, we consider treating prostate cancer with surgery rather than radiation in known Lynch syndrome patients. Obviously, future studies are needed on the topic. So in summary, some urologic malignancies are included in the Lynch syndrome tumor spectrum. Upper tract urothelial carcinoma and bladder cancer may present it, uh, as the uh, sentinel events leading to a diagnosis of Lynch syndrome. Uh, it's important for us as urologists to recognize Lynch syndrome factors or risk factors based on personal and family histories for cancer and refer appropriately if there's an elevated clinical suspicion. Screening protocols are still controversial, but I think it remains reasonable to at least screen with urinalysis for those with Lynch syndrome. Surgical considerations remain largely unchanged, but systemic therapies include immune, uh, including immune checkpoint inhibition show promise in this patient population. Um, that's all I have, and that concludes my talk. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Black for providing guidance on the topic. And uh, with that, I will open up the floor to uh, questions.